Okay, so we're gonna talk about a few things. Uh, first, a set of slides regarding the sensors and the actuators. And um, I will then talk about um, ADC, analog to digital converter. And at the end, I will uh, briefly introduce the accelerometer and gyro uh, chip that we're gonna use in the next lab. So today we're gonna look at what is a sensor and what is an actuator. We're gonna look at what is sensor first. A sensor is a device that measures a physical quantity. Um, so when we have this cyber physical system, it interacts with the physical world. So there are a lot of physical attributes that we want to understand. Uh, sound level, temperature, speed, uh, so these are the physical quantities. You can think about that the sensor is an input and we want to have some data that we can read from the physical world into this cyber space. On the other hand, a actuator is a device that modifies a physical quantity. So you can use a device to uh, drive uh, your motor, drive your gear, or you can um, you know, um, turn on the LED or turn off the LED. And you can have other you know, physical qualities, physical attributes that you want to um, have if impact or have effect on using a device. And such a device is a actuator. So as opposed to the input, now we are talking about actuator as an output. So we want to have some capability to write to the physical world. Um, not literally write, but to have some impact to the physical behavior of the system. Uh, here's a, just a short list of the sensors. Um, for example, cameras, uh, image sensors, accelerometers uh, measuring the uh, acceleration, and gyroscopes are measuring the uh, rotation and uh, we also have uh, strain gauges uh, which is to measure the uh, pressure or the strain uh, on the surface and we have sound sensors microphone uh, we have uh, magnetometers to measure the uh, magnetic fields uh, radar and lidar to uh, monitor the distance and also you know, a variety of kind of chemical sensors pressure sensors and switches, uh, all these are different sensors. And um, for a modern car, uh, there are a lot of sensors equipped it, uh, from parking assistance, brake assistance, um, you know, traffic alert, uh, lane departure warning, uh, side impact, uh, parking assistance, um, you know, blind spot detection, so all these uh, fancy systems on modern cars are uh, enabled with sensors. Uh, it's important that we use these sensors to uh, understand the physical surroundings, um, the distance between cars and between uh, obstacles, and be between you know, um, pedestrians and their cars. Uh, so those are what we need to understand when we uh, design and implement these uh, subsystems within this modern cars. Um, and in this particular diagram, uh, we use two colors to illustrate some of the sensors are ultrasonic and some of them are based on radars with you know, active uh, sound signals, radar signals. Um, also with the cars, uh, we see here uh, a lot of the um, systems or sensors that we uh, have to have, and they vary based on their um, functionality and also their cost. Um, for example, GPS uh, you know, can be used to track the location. Uh, it combines readings from different sensors, uh, tachometers and altimeter and gyros uh, pr to provide the most accurate positioning. The cost could vary based on the precision you require. And uh, ultrasonic sensors is to measure 
the position of objects uh, very close to the vehicle as opposed to LIDAR. So that's the light detection and ranging. To, that's to monitor the vehicle surroundings, road, vehicles, uh, other vehicles, pedestrians, etc. And that's you know, uh, used to, um, to measure objects with a further distance. Visually, we need to use video cameras to monitor the, the surroundings. And uh, nowadays, we use deep learning algorithms to analyze these videos in, in runtime to understand the um, traffic light, to understand the moving vehicles and the pedestrians. Um, and then and that's um, you know, kind of enabling te technology for the auto driving um, you know, um, features in modern cars. Um, on the top, I hope you can see this video. Um, this shows a very early project, basically 20 years ago, um, UC Berkeley had this research project uh, that they you know, modify the cars with um, you know, sensors and write uh, control software to implement this self-driving. Um, you can see that in terms of just looking at the interface, this is rudimentary compared to the modern Tesla. But at that time, um, this technology was so you know uh, advanced that they uh, they you know they really took a lot of effort to modify existing vehicles to equip those vehicles with sensors and uh, computational devices. So you can see here antenna for GPS. Uh, they have this, uh, you know, spectrum receivers, um, and you know a lot of um, sensors are mounted in outside the car. Uh, like here you have a camera, um, and so these sensors uh, enables the control software and to implement such a you know autonomous driving uh, system. And on the top right on the slide, you see that's the Google self-driving car. Uh, it's you know much smaller in terms of the car, but the sensors are um, even more than the uh, earlier project. And but you know the main message here is that the, these sensors played a vital role in enabling such autonomous autonomous vehicles. The other project is also from Berkeley, and uh, it's, this is um, 15 years ago. Uh, this is the, I don't know if you can hear the sound. Uh, this is a big machine, uh, the snow blowers uh, used in highway, on highways. So these vehicles, are, different from the previous one. Uh, these vehicles are huge and they go slow, uh, but uh, they have to be very precise. So the distance um, from the snow blower to the uh, rail of the highway has to be very uh, well controlled. Okay, so gap distance is, from one to three inches, um, because if you go over that, the you know, chance that the vehicle will be damaged uh, by colliding into the guardrail. Um, this is the uh, similar project. So what they want to show you here is the uh, sensors mounted underneath the car, uh, I mean the truck. It's the front uh, magnetometer uh, arrays that they use to 
detect the directions of this uh, um, you know, uh, blower truck. So this is where they keep the machine that runs the control software. Uh, it is, you know, was a old, soft, old platform uh, running a QNX real-time operating system. A simple switch, basically switch the uh, truck to uh, auto mode. And in that case, the control system will be able to manipulate the steering system based on the sensors reading. There's uh, also um, guidance indicators, warning lights, etc. This is the actuator uh, to implement the uh, auto driving. So this part of the video shows you know, this blower can be uh, operated uh, autonomously um, and keep a very fine distance between the blower with the guardrail. Yeah, very neat design. Um, this is the sensor that was used on that blower truck. Uh, it's the magnetometer uh, used to measure the um, magnetic field so that they can know the exact um, direction the truck is going. Um, it's based on the uh, Hall effect. Uh, the sense, this sensor works by charging a uh, conductor here uh, that this uh, uh, conductor a piece of metal and the electrons will go through this loop and because of the earth's magnetic field uh, direction uh, it will induce a uh, impact on how the particles the electrons accumulation on either side of the uh, conductor plate so if the um, electronic field is this way, then the particles will be um, saturated on one side, uh, on the other, you know, basically the further side of this plate. Uh, and that will uh, cause a measurable voltage difference uh, from the top to, to bottom. Um, and based on the direction and the uh, plate will be showing different uh, um, current and uh, magnetic field polarities. So this is essentially how the magnetometer works. And this one was used in that blower truck. Okay, so accelerometers. Um, yeah, because if, if people joining a little bit late, they will show up on my screen and I'll have to admit them. Um, okay. You will use uh, accelerometers in many situations, uh, navigation, orientation, uh, drop detection, uh, image stabilization, airbags. Uh, so the usage of accelerometers uh, many, many places. And the most common design measures the distance between a plate fixed to the platform and the one attached by a spring and damper. So if you imagine that we have a um, plate like this, and this is the fixed frame, and the um, movement part this is the movable mass, uh, which is connected to a spring and a, a damper that's not really shown here, but in the movement of this mass could be this way or that way. 
uh, if you move this mass uh, further, the, the spring will pull it back um, towards the center. If this moves too close to the um, spring, to the uh, fixed frame, then the other direction of the force will push this mass away. Uh, so e this um, platform could be in different orientation, but you know, uh, either way, this movement of the uh, this movable piece will be along this platform, this direction. And the the um, measurement is typically done by measuring the capacitance between this movable piece uh, and the fixed frame. Based on the distance of these two pieces, the distance um, so they will produce different capacitance, which can then be measured. Uh, so that's essentially how we um, you know, measure the uh, acceleration in a given platform, in a given direction. Um, there's a physical model behind this kind of design or this system. Uh, based on Newton's second law, uh, the force is uh, equals to the uh, mass uh, times the acceleration. So uh, we will be using this um, basic principle to calculate uh, the, um, the acceleration. Uh, for example, the F could be Earth uh, gravity, gravitational force. And if you have this um, system vertically, let's say this uh, moving direction is vertical uh, along the Earth's gravity direction, then for this movable piece to balance, essentially that's going to be uh, the uh, you know, gravity of this piece. Um, so we can then use this Newton's second law to calculate the acceleration. Um, to be more precise, um, this is the spring mass damper system that we can model using Newton's second law and we have this uh, mass uh, represented with um, symbol M and the spring constant K representing the, um, the kind of um, elastic or the uh, property of the spring itself. And we use P to uh, represent the position, the rest position, which is a neutral position uh, where this um, uh, mass can sit with, with there's no movement and the position of the mass will be X, which is a variable that will change uh, from time to time. And the viscous uh, damping constant will be the opposite force that will be pushing this piece away if it's get too close to the fixed plate. So what we can do is we have um, a few um, equations can be established. Uh, this force uh, F1, at time t equals to this spring constant uh, times the position, the rest position, uh, minus uh, the current position of the mass. And so based on how far this um, uh, movable piece is from the uh, neutral position, the spring will be generating a force to pull you back. So this is what essentially is describing that force. And this is the spring constant, and this is the displacement of that movable piece. And on the other direction, we have a viscous uh, damping effect, which will be push pushing um, the um, um, movable piece away if it's getting too close. And this is uh, calculated as the uh, damping constant C, uh, negative because it's the opposite direction. This uh, X dot T, this is actually the um, change of the position in terms of time. So you can think about this as the speed uh, of that 
uh, movable piece. Okay. And Newton's second law, uh, we can represent that using this uh, equation here. These two force you know, together, um, one is the positive direction, the other one is the opposite direction because of negative sign. This force equals to the, the mass of that movable piece times the acceleration. So x two dots t, this is the acceleration, so the change of speed. Okay, this is in fact what we want to measure using the uh, accelerometer. Now with this uh, accelerometer, we can also measure the tilt of the device. Um, the way we measure that is very simple. Uh, if you tilt this device in, to a certain degree, assuming that let's say uh, from the um, you know, vertical, we tilt this um, platform in this way uh, with an angle to the horizontal line, there's a theta degree. And because this device will also have uh, gravity that will be applied to this moving piece. So that gravity uh, force, which is going down, will be, um, can be represented using you know, two um, axes. So one going this way, one going um, you know, the, the other way, which is you know, perpendicular to the uh, platform. And the direction, um, the gravitational force uh, applied in the direction of the, uh, this platform, which is the uh, accelerometer's axis, must be equal to the spring force. So what we see here is the, the mass uh, times the uh, G, uh, gravity force, um, the, uh, the constant will, will um, find out this angle using sine um, to get that portion of the force. That's the same as the, um, uh, the first equation that we saw earlier, which is the constant, uh, spring constant times the uh, neutral position um, subtract this uh, current position. So the displacement from the neutral position. So given a measurement of this X, uh, which we can uh, have um, you know, in some way, and if you know this displacement, this distance, you can then solve this equation to find out the theta. And there's ambiguity of pi because you may tilt this way or um, the other way. So there's, you know, um, some ambiguity, ambiguity uh, possible. So that was a um, brief explanation of how accelerometers uh, work uh, to measure the acceleration. As we can see that there are some um, things we need to consider when we design or use accelerometers. First of all, uh, it's difficult to separate tilting from acceleration. And we saw earlier that there's uh, gravitational force can be applied if you have the um, platform tilt in certain degrees. Also vibration will um, cause the accelerometers to uh, have a lot of uh, interference in uh, finding out the displacement of uh, the moving piece. The ax could be uh, impacted by using by the vibration. Also in the previous model, we assume the, um, the uh, spring um, properties are constant K and the uh, viscous uh, damping effect is a constant C, uh, but those could be uh, non-linear in the um, real situations. So the model could get complex. Also, if we want to use accelerometer to uh, get back to find out the position, there can be some issues. What we show here is um, in order to find out the um, uh, position, we essentially need to find out the initial position P0, so at the initial state, and then we do an integral on the uh, velocity, uh, this tau, 
uh, uh, this V uh, tau, so the velocity, uh, you know, doing an integral on the T, uh, that will give you the uh, displacement or the distance between uh, the current position and the, uh, the starting position. And to find out this uh, uh, velocity, we can use the acceleration to do the same similar uh, integral calculation. So we have a starting speed, and then we do a integral on the acceleration um, over t. Then that will give you the the difference uh, on the speed, and then using this difference and the initial speed, in theory you can get get the um, current speed. But because now you are doing two times of these uh, integral, uh, in, integral uh, computation and any um, displacement, any uh, bias in these uh, measurement will cause this um, um, huge um, uh, inaccurate um, estimate error uh, on the um, position of that uh, of that uh, you know move, movable piece. So to resolve these issues, uh, so in 1979, sorry, 1997, uh, there's one PhD dissertation uh, specifically on how to improve the accuracy of these micro accelerometers. And the design is called the feedback control, digital feedback control. Uh, and that uh, essentially um, solved a lot of these issues and improved greatly the accuracy of uh, accelerometers. And these designs have been implemented in the uh, modern MEMS based devices um, to create such accelerometer chips used in airbags and computer games and disk drives and your you know, wearable watches, um, the, all these applications. Um, so that was the uh, some history there. And this picture shows um, at uh, you know microscope level how these uh, MEMS devices are designed to uh, measure such uh, accurate uh, accelerometer values. Okay, so that was the accelerometer sensor. Uh, next two slides, we're going to look at uh, the other sensor, gyroscope. Gyroscope uh, is used to measure the changes in orientation. Uh, so when you change a object, you can rotate it uh, in different ways. Essentially, you can uh, you know, think about there's uh, three dimensions you can rotate as we can see from the uh, left side of the you know, animation here. Um, traditionally, you can use uh, optical gyros. Uh, that is to leverage the Sagnet effect using lasers. So on the right side of this diagram, we show um, the design in principle. We have a light source that will generate uh, lights and we have uh, you know, basically light beams going out from this way. And we have um, mirrors uh, that's formed in this particular shape. And if there's no rotation, this light source will be reflected multiple times uh, along these uh, mirrors. And because there will be uh, some light beams um, traveling in different directions so that uh, there will be interference. And such interference will be measured uh, by uh, some other sensors uh, at this viewing screen. When you have this, you know, uh, several mirrors are rotating, the light travels at, uh, uh, in one direction will be, the distance will be smaller than the light travels in the other direction. And using this, uh, it will cause uh, the um, you know, changes in the interference. And based on the changes in the inter interference, we can uh, infer the uh, rotation uh, in that uh, uh, direction along that axis. Um, 
Well, of course, you know, people have been improved that using MAMS um, um, gyros instead of using optical. Um, the the um, second lab, actually, we're going to be using both uh, the accelerometer and gyro uh, to, to build a, a game. Um, you know, I can talk about that next class, uh, but, you know, just... Uh, Give you some teaser to to get excited about. Um, next uh, sensor is the inertial navigation system, or well, sometimes you can see the terms IMU, uh, internal um, inertial measurement units. Uh, these are combinations of uh, things. Um, the inertial navigation system is combines. GPS uh, for uh, initialization and uh, some error checking periodically. Um, also in this system, it has a gyro that will measure the orientation and it has three axes typically. Uh, in addition to the gyro and GPS, uh, you can find uh, accelerometers uh, for three axes and um, it, uh, integrated for positioning after the correction and for orientation. Uh, such systems are designed uh, in very high accuracy. Uh, the typical drift for the system uh, using aircrafts can be you know, 0.6 nautical miles per hour or tens of degrees per hour. Um, they have to be uh, calibrated um, from time to time um, and depends on the um, actual applications. You may need to find more accurate system than this. Uh, you know, it really depends on the application to understand whether you have uh, you know, enough accurate, enough uh, sufficiently accurate system measurement sensors for your system. The next sensor is uh, string gauge. Um, string gauge is um, for measuring the growth of a crack uh, in uh, you know, masonry foundation or uh, other surfaces. And with uh, this um, kind of sensor, you will uh, be able to detect the tiny movement over a longer time period. Um, to understand uh, how uh, these objects, the surface have uh, uh, deformed or changed their shape. Uh, the tensions uh, will cause the, um, uh, the area between these sensitive patterns to change. Uh, as a result, that will change the uh, circuit's uh, resistance. Uh, so by measuring the resistance, you can understand uh, how these surfaces uh, change their shapes, change their uh, formation. Uh, 